Hi, listeners. Welcome to It's the People, an interview series where we explore the inside story of building companies and investment portfolios with high octane founders, limited partners, and fund managers. We hope these conversations push you to be even better at what you do. This week, my partner Andy Greenfield and I had the opportunity to interview an exceptional entrepreneur. Ryan Smith is the co founder and CEO of LeafLink, a B2B sales and marketing platform for the cannabis industry with the single largest marketplace for brands and retailers. Prior to co-founding LeafLink, Ryan successfully started and exited two previous companies. We've had the benefit of knowing him and working with him for many years across numerous ventures and always learned something new about his philosophies around building companies. We discussed a range of topics, including building an internal talent acquisition team early on, the importance of what Ryan calls straight talk and being direct within the team, his visceral reaction to indecision and how it makes him want to throw up, and much, much more. To start things off, Ryan begins the conversation with his life story in 60 seconds. Before we begin, I just want to note that this interview is for informational purposes only, and that the opinions expressed should not be relied on as a basis for investment decisions. TIA Ventures is a seed stage fund focusing primarily on early stage B2B technology companies with an obsessive focus on end customers and early teams. So Ryan, uh, really excited to have you today on our uh, series and maybe to get things rolling, you could paint a picture of yourself at, you know, I know 60 seconds is a short amount of time, but can you give us the Ryan Smith life story and about 60 seconds? Well, first off, thanks for having me. And uh, it's good to do this with you guys. 60 seconds. So I grew, I grew up in, in Manhattan, raised by two other entrepreneurs uh, at a real estate company in New York. My mom's the CEO, my dad's the president. Family dinners were always talking about business. Uh, I have a little sister, long-term girlfriend now. And uh, I was the kid that was always starting a business, putting up signs in the building where I grew up to take care of pets and and people's houses, plants, whatever. Uh, At a very young age, like I think probably fifth or sixth grade, I started selling things online. So I've had an eBay account now for almost 20 years, which is uh, pretty crazy because I just had my 30th birthday uh, and things weren't nailed down in the house. And parents would say they are probably now in Ryan's PayPal account. And I just love this whole idea of like finding, transacting, negotiating. Things are valuable to no one, to not one person, but another person, like discovering all those things were super interesting to me. And that really led into my experience in college, which was, um, as you both know, Colgate, a liberal arts school. And I think there I really began to unlock and realize all of these natural patterns that I had that were most exciting, interesting to me could be the full-time thing. And so uh, I jumped into starting a company right after school that we exited into this publicly traded company like 18 months later. And for the last six years, I've been building the largest B2B platform for legal cannabis companies. You know, I think you kind of preempted what, what would be our first question here. We sometimes talk about whether or not entrepreneurs are built or born. And, you know, I I don't think there's a lot of questions around uh, whether or not you were built or born. Clearly born an entrepreneur. Uh, That said, there's a lot of natural athletes out there who never make it to the Olympics. And I guess I'm curious, what have you had to build to, you know, what muscles have you had to build uh, in order to become the entrepreneur that you are today, assuming that there was a lot of natural talent there? There's still a lot of learning to do. The bit that I've always, that I've continued to work on is like the difficulty of delegating. And I think I've gotten much better at that just as I get exposed to people with greater skill sets, deeper experience and, and backgrounds that can just do a better job than I can at certain things. But up until probably LeafLink, Whenever I was, you know, the social chair of the fraternity or selling things at school or selling things online, it was always, I was doing everything and there was no one really there to support me. And so I just got into this routine of like, there's no job too small. Everything is important because it's all just the next step to the, to the next step. And so figure it out, take care of it. And that's it. And now I'm getting more comfortable with, I think, developing a muscle of just like finding the best people we possibly can welcoming them to the team. And then as a result, creating an environment that everyone else can learn too, from people that have more advanced skill sets on things that, you know, for example, I was closing out LeafLink's QuickBooks for the first couple of years. Now we have a full finance team and it's, these are just like things that are required and necessary, but definitely took some learning. 
Is there anything that pushed you over the edge on that one? Because that's often one where people have to get hit in the head with the two by four to let go. Uh, and sometimes people just are fortunate that they do it naturally. How, how did it happen? Is there any watershed event or you just said, I can't work 24 seven or. It probably came mostly from advisors and, and investors. I'd say I, it took me probably, so, you know, LeafLink, we've raised over our $125 million in equity, quarter billion dollars in debt over the last five years. And it took me several years to understand, like, what do I enjoy the most? What am I actually good at as I meet more people, seeing things that other people are good at? And then just like kind of playing to those strengths and the things that are not my strengths and having more of that self-reflection and awareness, I could say, all right, well, I'm, I have a skill here or I'm interested here, just as kind of just as important and others are interested elsewhere. And so like, that's to me, the team. And there's also just getting to meet more people. Like one of my other, I think, skills is the ability to, you know, share my excitement for what we're building at LeafLink specifically, but then just generally like connecting and, and building relationships. And so those things to me are most exciting and the ability to delegate allows me to devote more time to those things that I find more interesting and important and what I can provide uniquely to the business. So you talk about delegating and I'm, I'm curious, like as you let go of some of these activities and you hire people and you've done such a good job at this, you know, you go from running the QuickBooks to now having a full finance, you know, back office, I'm guessing that's handling your books and tax and all that. How do you know if those people that you bring on are doing a good job? Two ways. There's first continued reliance on advisors, investors, and having them build relationships with those people as well as the company. Sometimes a lot of the recommendations or referrals will, will even come from these groups. So they're a bit pre-vetted. The second is, and I've noticed this happen a few unfortunate times, there's almost organ rejection of people that are not maintaining some of the missions, some of the mission and cultural pillars that we find really important, at least like, like saying it's straight, being direct, um, you know, high levels of ownership. If you don't have those things, you tend to get, it just, it's kind of like an organ rejection I think happens. So by bringing in great people, then it helps maintain a certain standard. But I think that's why it's important to always continue bringing amazing people, even more amazing time and again, uh, really true rock stars so that you can always have that standard kind of natural maintenance. It gets harder when you get bigger, I'm sure, but like we're, I think we're actually hiring our 200th person this week. So uh, it still works that way, but maybe when it's, you know, 2000, it's different. I'd love to take a step back. A minute ago, you talked about, you know, learning the things you're good at and the things you're not good at. I mean, a lot of us would look and say, hey, Ryan's a great entrepreneur. He's going to be good at most stuff. What is it if you're looking in the mirror and what do you see that this is my superpower, this is real my strength, and this is the area where, you know, it's not my strength. It's a limitation. I get excited by and like doing things that I think make most people feel uncomfortable. If you even think about LeafLink six years ago, some people said, you know, if you go into the space, you may never come out. There's only one legal market. Who knows all the, you know, prejudices that are about what people in this industry are like, which are just not the case. But I did anyway because it seemed clear to me like this is there's an inevit inevitability here uh and so i think doing things that i spike and doing things that other people feel uncomfortable and bring process and like structure to them in a way that i think allows us to create i think the second piece is sharing the excitement and the grind of the early parts of doing something that makes others uncomfortable sharing that with others uh bringing on partners and then also getting to the point where and working through it becomes obvious that this is going to be something incredible or the thing that wasn't so clear is now clear to most. And so the same people that may have said, you know, if you go into the space, you may never come out are now saying, oh, LeafLink, like what a great team, what an exceptional opportunity. You all must be geniuses. And it's like, all right, great. So we saw that early. We built, we rallied around that and created momentum around that when most weren't looking. And now they see that, but you know, that took five, six years and a lot of hard work from a lot of people to get there. And there's, by the way, way more to do than we've done. So uh, I think that those are like the two areas that I probably take the most pride in. And, and you mentioned, so 200, almost 200 people now, 
Um, and you, you painted a, a quick picture of kind of the other ventures that you've started over your career, dating back to, you know, 10 years old, selling stuff online. And it sounds as though most of those ventures, or at least the ones that we're aware of, you know, you, you came up with the idea, built it, executed, and, you know, within two years, you were out. Um, LeafLink, on the other hand, what, 2015, 2014? Created first order was in uh, March 2016. Yeah, 200 almost 200 employees. Have you found a new gear or some new, you know, skill or superpower to Andy's point that you have that you didn't know you had, uh, or that never had a chance to kind of manifest on previous ventures? There's something really, I'm still working on this, but there's something that I find like really exciting now to, to, by bringing in more of these people, like what they can create and then like how it builds almost this like flywheel on itself. I, uh, I honestly like most enjoy just like there's, I like enjoy the challenge of if someone on our team wants to meet someone or we want to get in front of someone that like, I always figure out a way to do that. And then a lot of times it, it leads to those relationships that I talked about earlier. I think something that I'm proud of is when I think about the, the the people around our team that support our team from behind the scenes, that to me is like this just incredibly powerful asset that I've worked really hard on, but I've only been able to really recognize that after a few years of doing it and just getting exposure, being back in the city, things that you couldn't do on a college campus, for example, or even as like a very, very young child. Now I'm starting to see the results of that. And I think that's part of our competitive advantage and things that we don't even quite often talk about. But uh, that to me is something, and then that I think beget that enables a world where you can again bring in these even greater people and just keeps building more and more on itself. There's always something else to beat, of course, or someone else to know that we don't. But I like that that journey. I want to drill a little into Ryan Smith, the man. The you know we deal with lots of early stage founders, and a lot of them are they're, they're challenged by emotion getting involved in decision making, whether it's related to personnel, inter-founder relations, et cetera. You appear from the outside to be a guy who is pretty dispassionate when it comes to decision making, personnel, stuff like that. Is that real or is that just an appearance? There's a million choices to make, and I, I really can't get hung up on any which one. I'm more comfortable that if it's not the perfect choice, but it's even 75, 80% right, we could course correct to that final 20, 25%, but at least we're moving forward. I, I have like a, I'd say it's natural because I have almost like a, I have a physical negative reaction, almost like a partial, like I feel like I, with indecision makes me almost want to throw up. So, so yeah, maybe it's a natural thing, but there's another element where it's like, I'm, you spoke to my girlfriend, I'm thinking about a lot of these things all the time and like scenario playing and thinking through like, what could lead to what and who do we know in the market that can impact this? And just like all of that type of schematic outline, like where, where, how do what happened? How do you get to Z from A and all things in between? And so sometimes I could just give an answer straight and it might be interpreted as like, uh, too fast or like this, like he doesn't actually care, but it's actually like, I've thought this through. I think my co-founder Zach is actually quite similar. It's like, I've thought this through 10 ways. And so I have an opinion. I'm willing to, by the way, be corrected. Or if you present some data that you know more about than I do, like we could talk about it and come to a better decision for the, for the team. But a lot of times I'm, I'm confident in what I'm saying when I have to make a decision, because I've, I've, I've thought it through and times when I'm not, I'll basically, and I've said this to, to our team in meetings, like, I know about 10% of what you know in this thing. So like, give me some options and what do you prefer to do? Because that's probably what we should do. You know, it's like, there's a lot of things happening at the company. That's one side of the coin. I think the other side is that we might say yes to too many things. And I think, Will, as you were asking before, you know, other things were a couple of years and it's been now five, six years at LeafLink. There's just such opportunity for our company, for the platform that LeafLink is. And so we are testing and trying a lot. And so there's probably a world where we could tighten it all in some ways, but we're still in this like testing 
you know, period. Our customers are startups. The space is a startup. And so we really have to be open-minded. But at the same time, I think we could also continue to grow in how we prioritize and focus on things. But maybe it's just the nature of being a Series C company. Ryan, you, you said say it straight, be direct, high levels of ownership, you know, and some of these kind of cultural values at LeafLink. And I think you just, you know, talked again, just based on Andy's question, you know, about the importance of being direct and saying it straight. How does that um, affect or translate to your ability to also inspire and get everybody super excited and, and be kind of the cheerleader in your own way around, you know, LeafLink and, and what you guys are trying to build? Like, is it hard to be super direct to Andy's point and, and very dispassionate sometimes in decision-making, but at the same time have to carry the torch of, you know, basically creating a business, creating a new category of business in a new market? All these things have been so much harder the last 18 months, uh, just not being together and the energy that was in just doesn't even need to be the office, but just at events or people around each other. Like we, there was a lot of positive, like type A, really driven individuals when you put them together, like that is, that is leafling to me. And that was my experience from the very early days. Like you lose some of that. And so I think when you have conversations on zoom or remotely, you don't, you can't read body language the same way. It might come off as more negative or even aggressive than it was meant to be. And so then sometimes people who are in their houses could go down a whole path of thinking that's actually not even the case and could probably have been rest assured if they bumped into that person later the afternoon or the next day. So I think it's been much more challenging and for the right people though, it is still, it is still exciting. I think it, it helps rally momentum around the goals that we have. But for some people, it is not exciting. It's, uh, you know, some people coming from, I'd say, like much larger companies, you know, it, it's really based on this concept that we need speed and we need to make decisions to move forward. And so there's no point in, like, you can't only plan so much, right? Uh, and so I think that's, for some, exciting. For others, they would prefer just to plan and not do much. And so for them, I'd say it's not doesn't rally them, but I think it rallies the right people. There's a balance. You know, Ryan, you've used the D word a lot, decisions. And if we roll the clock back six years ago, you start LeafLink. Now we're looking at a company six years later that's doing exceptionally well, approaching unicorn status, 200 people. And we often talk about an entre entrepreneur's path, which is a series of decisions. As you look back, are, are there any turns you made that you wish you hadn't? And conversely, were there any decisions you made that as you look back, you say, wow, that was the right way to go versus another way that may have been considered pivotal decisions? So mistake ones. Uh, I think I... The company that I started before LeafLink that we were fortunate enough to sell and it was a successful transaction, we were not as rigorous in the hiring processes there as we were with LeafLink. As we, but I mean, as we've gotten to and we'll continue to progress along for LeafLink. And so I think although that had a successful outcome, there was a lot of mistakes bundled up in there that just kind of get glossed over because the, the terminal state was a success or you know somewhat successful. I think that was one. Another, when thinking back even further to when I first met both of you, like in college, the progression was always very clear. Like even growing up, although I loved doing all these projects, it was you go to this school, you go to that school, you go to this college, you work at Goldman. That was like pretty much the progression. Uh, and, and I, you know, entertained that always as a thing that was like that. All right. Well, that seems like the most competitive thing. It, it's interesting. You know, I, I find these topics fascinating. So, go with that. I think I probably spent a little too much time considering it, like doing the super day and all those different things. Uh, but I think what, what, what really helped honestly was I had a pretty serious brain injury in senior year. And that was like, that was pretty rap that racked me a bit. And after I came out of that, I thought to myself, I'm like, wow, well could just be dead. 
So uh, what are we what are we even thinking about here? Like do the things you want to do. You know, it might, might be dead tomorrow or the day after or today. So like, I just don't want to have any of those regrets living my life. And so I don't really have very many of them looking back since graduating. There's probably a million little mistakes that were made, but things that I just can't. The same way, like we've got to make decisions and move forward. Always moving forward is another thing that we say a lot uh, at the company, say a lot of my family. I just can't get too hung up on mistakes made. And although there were, I'm sure many, but none that were so foundational that like I deeply regret. That I didn't know yeah. about the the brain injury, uh, you know, and th those kind of existential moments can be so impactful. I know I've ha I've experienced some of them. The only challenge I find is that like a couple of years later, they feel dull in your memory and you kind of just get into the pattern of life again. I'm curious, like, do you have a way of keeping moments like that that drive you just, you know, front of mind constantly like a reminder to say, hey, like keep pushing forward, keep breaking rules, or is there any way that you keep that fresh in your mind? The experience itself, I like don't, I more remember the end period. So like, I, and I actually prefer not to like call it to, to, to mind too uh, frequently. I I think always pushing forward for the next thing. And I think there's like a challenge. I just read the psychology of money, but it says like, there's always a challenge in like recognizing success as you define it, because we like to keep pushing the goalposts back. But I think there's something healthy about doing that at certain stages of your life versus others. And to me that like, increased competition risk are all very exciting within within a re, you know within reason and so that for me keeps it that, that makes me feel like I'm always moving forward and challenging myself and so then as a result not doing anything that I would regret not having done 5 10 50 years from now and so it's lightly woven through it i will also say that i was probably like 80 75 80% sure i wanted to be an entrepreneur and so I was kind of like on the cliff and that just like totally, you know, kicked me off, uh, full hardly. So it was a good, I think it was a good experience and there was a good that came from a very negative experience. Let's go turn the clock back again it, to a time when I think LeafLink was maybe two years old, maybe one year old, you had a chance to sell LeafLink. That would have been think, that. That would have been the biggest mistake. So, that, <laughs> good memory. That would have been the worst one. Hundred yes. percent. Well, we remember <laughs> we remember that well, and it was, I think it was for twelve million dollars. Leaflinks now approaching a hundred times the value that you would have sold it at. It, can you talk about, you know, it's actually it's, yeah, you're right, hundred. Okay, yeah, the. Uh, Unless there's a round coming up. No, 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 not that I heard of yet, no. <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about, because you were pretty close. You were at the 11th hour. Um, what did you learn from that? Um, Context. In any so thoughts you that would have been That would have been an epic mistake. That one that, that would have been an epic mistake. But let me just, to set the scene there, this was end of 20, it was a 2016 election. So it was November, December 2015, I believe, whenever the election season was for, the, for, for, for Trump. We were at Web Summit. This was a, so we were at Web Summit uh, and woke up, and I remember leaving on a plane to go there, and I said to my girlfriend and my co-founder, I was like, could you imagine if we come back to America and Donald Trump is the president? Like, wouldn't that be, I can't even, you know. And then sure enough, two days later, and being in Europe when that happened, it was like the world was ending. It, I mean, I know it felt that way here. So there was that. And then in the months that followed, there were all these like jokers that he pulled in, um, like Jeff sessions, sessions, which how many letters do we have to write to our investors to assure people that, you know, this person from the 1800s wasn't going to come burn their houses down because he was so backward. So there was just this whole like, this industry might be over, you know, and so... We should seriously consider how to be good stewards of the capital we've raised because it was just such a dark, scary, unclear time. And I think that that influenced us. And we ultimately decided not to do it, which was the right decision. But yeah, you're right. We got pretty far down the path in a very, very dark world. 
generally, but also specifically for, for cannabis. And, 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 if the, and if there were a, a bunch of founders sitting around early stage, you know, they've done their seed and they're going, so what advice should we take from this? Because you probably know, because you've studied a lot of finance and history, you know, there's a famous financier who said, I made my fortune by always selling too early. And I think we would all agree that would have been too early. But what do you say to other founders who, and for them, this may be $12 million life-changing money. It all depends on what you want. I mean, what do you... A lot of money is a very subjective concept based on so many other factors and how people define it is totally different. So if it's a lot for you and that's all you ever want to do and need to be happy, fine. It's probably a decision for you. It doesn't mean it's the same for someone else with the same exact company from a different background. So my advice would, I mean, it's, yeah, my, my, that would, there's no right answer. You know, like if you want to do it, it's your company. It your investors that you brought on, your team, it's your decision. Uh, I mean, yeah, there's there's another reality where, you know, it, it, who knows? It, maybe that there's another reality where that, that could have been the right decision for whatever reason. And, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I think there's just, there, there's no right answer. So I can't like get too judgy with people on like, when's the right time to do this or that. I think what's pretty amazing right now is the concept of a lot of money is, you know, there's, I think there's like 1500 unicorns now, and it's almost like becoming a billion dollar company is just like, that's, a, that's good. You know, it's pretty good, $10 billion. You know, it's exceptional, a hundred. And I think it's like, it's becoming that kind of world with the amount of cash that's flowing around, but that may not be what a founder needs to feel successful for themselves or, you know, he or she could do whatever they want. It's their, it's their story. And I got to jump in because that was a perfect springboard. So what does this founder, Ryan Smith, need to feel successful? I want to be at least an exceptional company. So I think we're building something that is powerful for our customers in the cannabis industry. But I think we're also creating a comp around a B2B unified platform that other industries can learn from, emulate, leverage. Maybe there's even opportunities for us there 10 years from now. And so that to me continues to be exciting and makes it like a, that's, that's, that's a, that's a vision that we should be working towards all the time and creating that standard defining, defining B2B. Uh, so that keeps me interested and in, I, I don't see, I don't see any near term ending to the story. So, so I'm curious, you've had the benefit of, you know, call it being an architect in a new market right on this b2b side of like what the market should look like and we're going to build technology against that vision um and it seems as though things have gone pretty well according to plan i'm sure you know we don't see the inside day to day but you know if we rewind the tape back to when you first had the idea for what leaflink is and what leaflink is today i'm guessing it looks pretty close to what you thought it would be um and maybe you can challenge that. I'm just curious, you know, now you've built this thing, have there been any, any unintended consequences of, of you building your vision um, and, and the industry taking form that you actually don't think should have happened or that you'd like to undo now, especially as you think about applying this B2B model potentially and, you know, to other industries and saying, hey, here's how we should do things. Like anything that's happened, you're like, wow, I wish that actually hadn't happened. And in fact, I don't think this is good for the industry or the customer. Yeah. So on the first part of the question to like, are, is it, I think it's pretty close to the original concept that Zach and I thought of around a B2B marketplace. We think of ourselves more as a platform now. The marketplace is where orders are created and then we support their full life cycle. Payments, financing, delivery, the data and advertising all along the way. I think the industry is... It's painful that it's still federally illegal for, I mean, so many reasons. Like we just had our first B2B payment between two customers happen on LeafLink a couple of weeks ago. That took us like five years to figure out with partnerships, compliance, legal. And our customers have dealt with this stuff all the time, right? Like they're moving around cash and checks and it's just so difficult. And so the fact that it's so federally illegal is, diff is challenging. 
But I think that longer term, we'll look back and the federal illegality actually enables more fragmentation that I think gives more opportunity to small, medium, and even large sized businesses that are regional operators to, to chart their own path. Whereas if it had gone federally legal in 2015, then it would look very different. I mean, it would be a space owned by three or four companies, uh, similar to probably liquor or, you know, you'd have Nabisco, PepsiCo and, you know, Coke running the whole industry, maybe throw in a Philip Morris or Constellation. And that's the story. But I think we have this opportunity to enable more fragmentation. And we had a trip up though along the way. There were some states that had really monopolistic licensing structures, a bit crooked along the way. And so that really made it difficult for small businesses, partic particu particularly uh, diversity and inclusion businesses, people that have been negatively impacted by this industry, haven't even had a shot to be a part of the legal version. A lot of that's correcting, I'll say. I think those models, there's like one or two that exist, but it's very much aged out. People are very focused on how do we empower all different kinds of businesses of all different sizes. So I feel optimistic about that, but it was definitely you know ups and downs along the way. I think there's something interesting happening though, that the space is going to be like, I think quite a model for a tech first operating supply chain that others will look to as an example. You know, if we can shift gears a little bit, Earlier on, you talked about getting uh, good advice from investors uh, and some of the advisors around you. One of the things I think that's defined you since Wills and I have known you, which has been, I don't know, 11, 12 years, yeah. is that you're fearless when it comes to reaching out to people for advice, counsel, reach out to people, as, as you say, know stuff that you know or have muscles you know. Without naming names, who do you listen to and why? It depends on the topic, but I think recently I've just been most, I've been closest with, most reliant on, and I think vice versa, founders that are either right where we are or a stage or two ahead. Because a lot of things we're thinking through are organizational, uh, scaling challenges, growth things that they've other, other operators, other founders have been through. And so I find myself most, most comfortable with, but also most reliant on, on that group at this moment. Investors and, and, uh, people who used to be operators, but now are investors are probably like second to that. But a lot of times, you know, one group introduces you to the other and, and it's kind of this fun, fun, small community, but I'd say more like yeah, operators, other founders in and around where we are. And then I like paying that forward too, to the extent that I know anything more than people that are a little bit earlier than us, like happy to be supportive and give them pointers the way I'm relying on others ahead of us. I've ever been, um, cause, cause I do, you know, share the, the feeling with Andy that you possess this rare ability that we see to take advice, digest it in your own way and kind of apply it. Any instances where there's been consensus in the advice that you're getting, you've said, no, I'm going to do it another way. And it proved to be the right decision. Well, first I, there, there's more struggle than might be obvious on the amount of input we're getting. It's never, there's never, there's rarely consensus. Actually, two years ago, one of my, uh, one of my, one of my New Year's resolutions or like one of the goals personally was to limit the number of advisors I had because I felt like I was just hearing too much from too many. It's like too many incredibly successful people, too many billionaires telling me what they think I should do. And it's confusing. Uh, so I was like, let me tighten it down to what, you know, otherwise I, then I, I get back to this like indecisiveness because it's just like all these people are incredibly smart and they've achieved such amazing things. And so their opinion, their opinion are worth, worth something. So that was actually like one of my goals for, I think it was 20, 2019, which I was able to do. So that, that, that has helped to make it clearer. I, I, I do remember one, one occasion way, way, way back where I think you had uh, a number of investors around you, some of which, uh, some of whom were saying squeeze as much revenue out of the retailers. Great one. Yes. And, 
the brands as possible. And you had some others who were saying, forget that, take territory, make it frictionless. Yeah. Okay. So this is, a, so one time, so one time that I could think of where we got uh, advice is when we were first pitching LeafLink in the seed round, we used the word marketplace, even though there weren't a lot of B2B marketplaces that existed, but because they heard that their minds went, oh, well, marketplace, you should take a take rate. That's how marketplaces work. And Zach and I were not confident that that, that was correct. That B2B is more complicated. There's a lot, of, lot more idiosyncratic differences between how those transactions and relationships work. That is not the same as a B2C marketplace. And so we really, I mean, every single round up until like pretty recently, like a year or two ago, people were asking like, take great, take great, take great. It's like, everyone, this is not how this works, right? There, it's, there's multiple monetization points across the life cycle of an order. That's why we're a platform. So I think we could have easily caved on that one. And instead of doing a flat rate dollar fee to be on the platform, we could have been charging a take rate from the beginning. There's a whole element around like we would have needed to get cannabis licenses as, to do that and et cetera. But we pushed back on that really hard. And, and that was advice given that we did not take. There, you know, Ryan, one other thing, because before we did this, you know, Wills and I and Randy were talking about, and Wills and I in particular, because we have no use since the dinosaurs roamed the earth. But, uh, you know, people think of Ryan's but this guy executes and you've seen the emails from us, you know, quarter after quarter, execute, execute, execute. So you're clearly something you're very, very good at. But I also think we don't give you enough credit for the creativity you've had, you know, coming up with, you know, whether it was from, uh, how do we create paper from a renewable resource to, uh, real estate platforms to a cannabis I mean, and cannabis and, you know, yeah, and, and, yeah. and these are fundamentally creative things. Where does that come from? I mean, you're a great executor. Yeah. Where does the creativity, is there some source wellspring, something in your background? I think most, anyone close to me would say I have like trouble with rules. If they don't make sense to me, I mean, they were just made by someone else a lot of the time. I think most people are like severely limited in how they see what's around them or the opportunities in front of them because of what they were told by someone else who's just someone else. I don't really, I, you know, I was like, I was probably a, I was a smart kid, but I was probably a pretty difficult kid if you ask my parents because of the same thing. And so I think I don't, I'm always interested in like thinking through what else what could be and, and taking risks. Otherwise, like, are we even writing an interesting story that anyone would want to read in our lives? And so for me, that's exciting. And yeah, I don't know. The creativity is if you talk to enough people. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's just kind of how it is. It's like what's most interesting to me talking about things that are already solved for or simple or are figured out are boring. Uh, and if someone if someone thinks they've figured something out, love to prove them wrong. But sometimes things just are a certain way and so move on to another topic that's yet to be explored and or is even a completely new space like where we where we operate today. Just I'm on this smiling. <laughs> I just want one quick one. I love that line. I have trouble with rules. And you find yourself running a the the leading company in one of the most regulated, rule bound industries on the planet. And we, but for the record, let it be known, we love compliance and rules in cannabis and we follow all of them like completely huge investments, millions and millions of dollars spent to make sure that we're, we're in compliance and we use licenses and all that. It's more of a comment about myself personally versus uh, yeah, the business. We recognize well, we're in a regulated space. I, I'm curious on this topic, let's say you woke up tomorrow and all of a sudden, you know, this has all been a dream. And you now have the chance to go build your next thing, be creative and execute and uh, maybe break rules or challenge assumptions, challenge the way, you know, some industry has developed. Knowing everything that you know now, building LeafLink, building other businesses, are there any qualities in an industry that you would look for or you know, business model types that you would focus on 
as you would set out on your next venture. And you know, again, I recognize you're still deeply involved in LeafLink more than ever. But like again, you just have the chance to wake up tomorrow and go after something else. What are you going to look for? What kind of opportunities? If I had a certain level of success that this was an option, I'd probably pick doing something. My family's in real estate. I love architecture. Something that I've always thought it'd be amazing to just build buildings that are simply beautiful. Like they don't make sense CapEx. They don't make sense as an investment. They're just like an incredible legacy to leave that lasts longer than you. And like, what if you could find the best architects in the world to like build their wildest dream structures? You have to fund that. Uh, but I find that incredibly like interesting. I don't think that actually makes very much money. It's probably a great way to spend a lot of money. <laughs> if, uh, if I had to make money, more money, uh, in this like alternate scenario and I was starting from, from step one and honestly, we're probably pretty similar. I think I, I, I love this B2B concept. I think there's a, a ton of opportunity. I actually think that the thing that disrupts all of the main players on the B2C side is that everything that, uh, these large companies touch comes through B2B channels. It's, it's a, it's a much, it's a huge market. And so I think that is what could be the disruptor for some of these incumbent B2C operators and other marketplaces that we're all familiar with. And so I'd probably go to another highly fragmented vertical. And if it was already, if there were already dominant players, I'd probably go to one of them and pitch them that you could be the first customer and investor in this business. And let's just bring everything virtual. Cause if you don't do it, someone else will, you're not the only one I'm meeting with. And so let's build this together. And I've thought about industries like, <clears throat> I think coffee could be interesting. Other things that have some kind of organic raw material that gets branded into a finished like, CPG item. I think there's opportunity there, but there's a, but for all the challenges we have being in a brand new space that we're defining something versus disrupting it in that scenario, there's a lot of disruption you have to do, which I think is a maybe even heavier weight to lift. But if I had to do something again or restart, I'd probably restart something that looked somewhat similar, uh, pretty similar and just maybe a different by a different name and a different vertical. You mentioned coffee, and I'm curious, as part of your calculus that you don't want to take risk on the end consumer's desire for the, I mean, I often think about LeafLink and it's like, well, yeah, cannabis works, right? Like it's worked for thousands of years. It is part of your thinking around something like coffee, again, not focusing on coffee like Hey, I love coffee, but like, hey, yeah, I don't want to take risk on on the end consumer demand for the product, but I want to fix a lot of the other problems in the business. Yeah, like I'd want to keep it simple. Like people like what they like now and they'll probably like that tomorrow. And I think that industry that we're talking about is particularly interesting because there's so many different small, medium, and very large operators, and they're everywhere, right? So there's like tens of thousands of locations and just probably the East Coast. <clears throat> That's a cool launch point. Uh, but yeah, I don't need to, if we're taking a risk on building a B2B platform, I don't need to take a risk also on if the end consumer will even want the item at the end of the day. Like let's, you know, let's step by step here. People were, were smoking cannabis and they will always be smoking cannabis. So that, that made sense on that one. The, you know, Ryan, one of the things we think about when we think of you as a, a guy who's kind of a relentless learner, appetite for building new muscles, developing new skills. If there was one skill set or one personality and one personality trait you'd like to have that you don't have, what would it be? A skill set and a personality trait. Skill set, I'd like to be able to have like a deeper, I love numbers and I see the world very much like in numbers. I'm always like counting. And anyway, I, I think I'd like to have more of like a, classical training on in finance i think that, that could be like really powerful i'd say that or legal because those are two things i'm just using constantly all the time and we have great partners there but if i had more of that i think it could be helpful a personality trait i'd say that i i i i could be more patient and maybe less judgmental but that's also i think served us well and in, in not in not moving slowly but uh but yeah, I think sometimes I like, I'll make a decision and, and that's that and, and we move on from it. So I'd say more more patience. Well, they sometimes say the 
flip side of a virtue is a vice. Some of us would look at your impatience as a virtue as opposed to a vice. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, is it, uh, now that you've built LeafLink to what it is, is it harder to take big risks? You know, like what is, is it harder to kind of like take the next swing for the fences now that you have something that's big and valuable and there's potentially the fear of messing things up? I don't think we're that big for what, for whatever it's worth. I think like, like I said, I think there's way more that we have in front of us. One thing that we're getting better at is we, I think you need to have like pockets of ownership and just have great people leading certain new efforts. And, and we're getting, this is something that we're still like working on improving on. We're not there yet, but then having clear like kill points or, you know, continue to support points by that person that is owning certain new opportunity. I don't know if there's, I don't know, like risk is all pretty relative. Like we're operating, you know, we're, we're helping 40% of transactions in the federally illegal industry. So it's like, some would say that's pretty risky already. That's, that's the, that's the grand slam swing. And, yeah. uh, but there's other ones within it that, that we take, but they all, they have to play into that larger goal of being this like unified industry defining platform. Uh, when I think about things that we're doing on logistics and data and payments, there's so much work that goes into them. And I think those are actually pretty big swings, but we spend a lot of time with counsel, with our team, with advisors and money to make those happen. And so they're, there are less swings more than I think calculated opportunities that we know will be a part of what a B2B platform and a marketplace within it means. And so we we take those swings, but if we're not taking risks, we're, we're slowly dying. I, I, I believe that firmly. So they may not be everyone as big as the, as the first one, but they have to continue, you know, to each part of what make, point of what makes the platform what it is. You've been on a, a hell of a journey here for six years. What's the biggest surprise you've had along the way i love so i find it most interesting to time we spend with clients and how quickly there's this incestuousness in cannabis where people are constantly jumping from one company to the next or one state to the next and one thing that we didn't uh consider early on was we knew there were a lot of startups in the space but how many we'd see when they started to when they ended to when they grew and like how we could be partners with them along that way is pretty special. I think a lot of times startups are trying to like find a hole in an industry and kind of work your way in and expand from there. Whereas we had this position to be just great partners to all these groups, but then seeing all those changes and then almost learning from successes and, and mistakes of our clients, because we're all like helping each other grow in a number of ways has been an awesome learning experience that I think in most other, in most other places, you're always trying to other, other verticals, you're trying to, as a startup, puff your chest up and make the sale, the deal with the big company. We don't really, ha we didn't really have that in the beginning. And so it's starting to get there, but we're also, you know, get to be lucky enough to be part of that conversation. I'm just looking through some notes here from our conversation already. And, um, we heard a similar theme from the founder of Balto Software saying, it's really valuable when I talk to founders that are either at my stage or maybe one or two steps ahead of me. And, um, you know, particularly around hiring, and you made a point about we're still getting better at hiring. And, and I argue they're already done a really great job. Any advice for founders that are maybe one or two steps behind you? about the things that really matter when it comes to hiring? First, build an internal talent acquisition team. My co-founder thought that originally, um, and before we had it, we have almost 10 people on this exceptional talent acquisition team within LeafLink now. We still work with external recruiters, but you have to internalize it. Your team will tell the best story than any you know anyone who's part-time working with you. So the sooner you can afford bringing on one or two individuals to really own that, incredibly important. I think the other thing that's really helpful is bringing in individuals that are, this is challenging. This is really challenging, but like bring in someone that actually is great for you three, four years ahead, but is willing to do the work of the next six, 12, 18 months. It, that is super hard to find. I, I personally, I think we've, you know, I've struggled with it because the company is changing so quickly. The space, our client, it's all changing so fast and you need to be comfortable with that. Um, 
And then when you find though those great people, which which we have as well, they also begin to in the leadership positions unlock new networks that can follow them uh, in some ways as you know something they're doing something interesting. They respect them, exciting, and that actually helps build momentum to the to the talent build and the the team you're cultivating as well. And so I could think of a few examples at our company, but there's others where. At certain, sometimes it seems like everyone's joining from one company to another company. It's largely because they brought on a great leader from that company, and it's a good way to I think scale quickly. And and are there practical methods for you talked about kind of enabling those people to unlock their own networks? Uh, are there you know practical things that you can do? to help those or enable those people to unlock their networks so that you do become this magnet for talent? A lot of it probably happens organic. I think a lot of it happens organically from them being impressed or excited or empowered by what's happening around them. And and I mean, there's no like clean answer to that. There's other more tactical things you can do. Like, you know, we have referral programs and we do check-ins with individuals like through an employee, employee engagement survey to see how, where else we can improve and just we're always constantly learning. We make that clear. And I think if people find that exciting and they want to move quickly in a space that there probably won't be another vertical like this, maybe crypto that comes, you know, comes to what comes to maturity right before our eyes in our professional careers. If all those things are exciting. Then we're a great place to be, but, uh, they have to feel that to, I think, want to share their relationships with the company. Mm -hmm. We're talking about building muscles. You talk to folks who are ahead of you. We have a lot of young founders uh, who look towards you and what you've done, uh, saying things like, wow, well, wish we were where he is. We wish we had some of what he has. If we put it on your lap now, who do you look up to and admire? I wish you had more of their vision, more of their talent. I, I've been most focused on this like team building recruiting thing. I think it's like the most important thing we could do at LeafLink. And I've really admired a number of people. We've been hiring a ton of people from honestly places like like Amazon and Apple that are in their day two. And the culture that some of these companies have created that these individuals then really operate with for the rest of their professional careers and bring that to other companies is something that I think is really like some, that's something to look up to. I don't know if it's any individual person, but just like some of these constructs around uh, focusing on the customer or prioritization of efforts and, and what we're all building. Like those to me are really hard and imperfect to know if you ever actually totally land it, but I've seen it at a few companies. And to me, that's something that I'd love for us to have too and create a world where I think we're on track for this, but people will say, oh, you worked at LeafLink when they went from X to Y and wow, what a story. Like, we'd love to have you here as a result. And then they bring with them things they've learned here that can create value elsewhere and empower other people. Those things to me are are really exciting. Uh, I, I, could, I could say names of people I look up to, but I think those types of cultures are things that I've been focus on mostly as of late versus any, you know, individual, one other entrepreneur or founder. And thinking about culture, and that was a, I really liked how you framed it. You know, somebody says, oh, you worked at LeafLink. Um, if, if you could wave a wand and in, sort of describe or wave a wand over your employees and they would embody the LeafLink culture, what would we assume about any LeafLink employee? What, what do they, what do they know? What do they do? What is, how does the culture manifest itself? A lot of the things we, we've talked about, like if, if someone, if that person joins your team, then they know how to take something from start to finish, deliver on it. They know how to be clear when there's challenges along the way, give the hard news and the bad news. Uh, we have a very celebratory culture at LeafLink. I think it's actually something that we're Thinking about, you know, we should share as much bad news as we do good news just to keep everything real. But I think as a result of that level of ownership across start to finish, you're creating things that we talk about building a better community at LeafLink. Uh, and really through collaboration, we get there. Like those are the things that I want people to think, all right, I'm bringing this person here. They're going to get us where we're going and they're going to make it better as a result along the way. That to me is exciting. And 
that kind of dependability and partnership uh, is something that would be valuable if you bring someone over from LeafLink in a few years. This focus on talent and people, I think sometimes can be overlooked when so many of the companies that we interact with are are building products and services that hopefully scale and are self serve and you know the the products themselves deliver the whole experience and and yet I find you talking so much about talent like the people behind all of this stuff. Do you have any advice for founders that are setting out to just tr- to impart to them? or say in a way that maybe communicates uh, more effectively from a founder like you, this relentless focus on talent, because at least from our perspective, too often, I think, you know, we hear these stories about great companies that built products that kind of sold themselves, but it's, you know, like you don't know all the people that were behind that, that made that possible. And I think it gets overlooked a lot. I'm just curious, like, any advice for new founders about the importance of people, not just the products that they're building? I never buy into this. I like, where did we see this on the social network where things just kind of like happen in an hour and a half. And then all of a sudden they sell themselves and you're a huge company. Like people take time to understand what you're building. And the only way to have them understand or literally buy into it is other people that have the skill sets to explain what value you're bringing to them. And so we hired we had, I mean, I was the first salesperson. Then we hired, you know, salespeople that were amazing and, and understood the industry early on. And we continue to, to do that. It doesn't just like these things just don't happen. Sometimes they do. But if you took the percent times that those happen, you could probably name those companies. I was like, that's not a good approach. Uh, and, and so if people have a hesitation around like, this is going to like, I hope this happens. I don't like operating on this. Like, oh, we don't hope. Like we do it, you know, and so if you're you're hoping that you're gonna have such something so amazing, so self serve that you're just gonna get there, like that's just not realistic. And maybe if it is, it will not be hurt by the fact that you are hiring great people to tell the story and sell the product as well. If anything, it'll just be better. So like you could still play that game, but at least you have, you know, something on the table that's helping you move forward regardless. And then the rest of it is just kind of it's just winning your sales. That's I, so. It's not. I, I it's not an either that, yeah. or. It's a yes and in that in that sense. Yeah, it's not. If it's, it's yeah. It's the second thing you said. It, either or is just you just don't want to do it. And like right, like just you don't want to. You don't know. Maybe you don't respect. I think there's another problem. A lot of people don't respect sales, or there's a lot of negativity towards people that create revenue. Not at LeafLink, but I think I've seen this elsewhere, and that is a huge mistake. Every team member is important at the company and one side doesn't work without the other, you know? And so people like to kind of drink their own Kool-Aid of who they are and where they sit, like where you stand depends on where you sit. But all these roles are really important in getting where we're going. So I feel really strongly about that sales is an important part. Account management is an important part. All you're doing in a lot of those roles is really building a relationship, a partnership with your customers. And so that's, that's, that's your end. You know, that's, that's how you support them. They support you and you, you keep going. So why do you think this perception exists that like, oh yeah, I'll just build a product and it'll sell itself and I'll create TikTok. I'm also speaking from a B2B marketplace where like nothing, you have to sell enterprise solutions. B2C, I just, it, to me, in a lot of ways, it seems kind of like a whole black magic. I don't understand. Like, so I don't know why some things work and other things don't. And uh, so maybe on that side, on that side of the spectrum, there are things that are that what I'm saying doesn't necessarily apply to. I just don't really understand B two C the same way, and all the kind of hacks, you know, but viral games that people play to 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 make platforms. It's just it's beyond it's beyond me. Ryan, we, we, we touched on before that LeafLink is, I'm guessing, given the uh, probably the GMV level, uh, you could argue without having to stretch your now unicorn status. Um, when and, well, how will you know when it's time to say, I'm done? Whether that means a sale, whether that means... Ryan Smith steps off the uh, uh, 
steps out of the car and says, here are the keys. Well, when I'm done, whenever that is, may not be the same as when LeafLink's done. I think we're probably in the second or third inning of the space, and it's been four or five years. I think there's at least another decade of just like really rapid building, maturing, scaling for us to do. How do I know when we're there? I mean, maybe when, if this unlocks new chapters, but maybe when we're the largest operator, largest company in the space, then it's like, all right, we've kind of we've topped out. Do we begin thinking about how we're going to consolidate, how we're going to, does it make sense to find a bigger industry that we can somehow partner and work with? Anything short of that, though, is just, I think, be more based on personal decision or some ex external factors that are not yet clear to us right now. Let me push on you a little bit on the question of how do you know when you're done there? You know, we've, we talk to entrepreneurs a lot and, you know, some of them say, Hey, once, once I get to the point where I don't know everyone in the company personally, I have the keys over and somebody else can do a better job. Others say, Hey, I'm not, you know, thousand person company. I'm not going to be good at managing that. You know, you've managed to continue growing, building the muscles, running the company, doing an, an excellent job pretty much from any perspective. When will you know? What will be the signal that, you know what? I think it's, you know, I need to give the keys to somebody else. Is it a skill-related thing? Is it a, you know what, I'm now financially, uh, you know, as healthy as I want to be, what what will be the cue? When we when we stop doing the reason why I love marketplaces because there's so many opportunities to do new things. When we stop, when we become a size or something happens to the culture that corrupts it in a way that new things aren't happening and it's not exciting and we're not doing things that just create that energy that I find intoxicating and really enjoy. That's one of them probably, that's when it's probably done for me. The reason why I like a marketplace though, is because there's, if anything, there's too many opportunities and that's what keeps interesting and what we're building and, and, and allows us to keep going. Uh, but the moment it, the moment the company becomes, I never wanted to work for a very large company. I never want, I never really want to, there's some scenarios where it might make sense for a certain period of time. But the moment we become that large company, which is like this weird end state that's actually the goal of every founder not wanting to join a large company anyway, <laughs> that's when it's like, well, I know I founded this company, but it's it now feels like, and I don't think this has to happen, but if it ever felt like, oh, this is now that large company, I didn't want to join either. Like, why? what am I doing? You know, And, and I'll do everything we can to not let LeafLink get there, but I think that would be some potential scenario where that would be a thought that goes through my mind. We're not doing new things and it's not exciting. I like that. One, one quick one comes to mind is we're talking about sort of like when it's time for you to hang up your spurs. What would, what's. I know Andy, these are very uh, old man kind of questions, you know, but I, I got like, at least what am I going to have 50, at least 50 years of building ahead. I mean, come on. I was going to say you're, you're, there was a, I can't remember the name of the movie years and years ago, but the, the star of the movie had this line that everyone used, never trust anyone over 30. And you've now crossed that threshold. Um, th what would Ryan Smith's epitaph be? What would, if you could write it, what would it be? On my tombstone, I've said this uh, in, to people before that if it said, this guy built marketplaces, that would be cool. That's that's great. I think like the back to what I found interesting when I was 10, selling things on marketplaces, meeting new people, finding value, like building those online communities. Like I love that. I, I just find it so endlessly interesting. And so if we could own B2B marketplaces in a way that that's what we're known for, that's what I'm known for, it feels like a, a life well lived. Oh, awesome. Maybe, maybe when I'm older and there's like, you know, Kids and fam, all those things, maybe the answers will be different. But if, if nothing else is clear in this interview, I'm obviously highly focused on what I'm doing every day. And so that's all, even the thing that I want in my tombstone right now. And as investors in Leech Lake, we're delighted to hear that. <laughs> Ryan, huge thanks for your time and energy and insight uh, and counsel. 
and uh, wishing you a uh, another 50 years of the same. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for all your support and uh, appreciate you having us. Awesome, Ryan. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for listening. Hopefully you heard something in here that helps you be better at what you do. Please visit our website, tiaventures.com, where you'll find more content and interviews like this, as well as some of the other stuff that we've published. Thank you. And remember, it's the people. The people.